we welcome you here this evening. This is your cathedral, your cathedral commons, and you honor us with your presence. We bid you share your wisdom with us this evening. This event is part of a series running through the spring as we strive to respond to an increasingly caustic public discourse in which ad hominem attacks and xenophobia seem to have found alarming legitimation. Last month, the bishops of the Episcopal Church, including our bishop, Greg Rickle, issued a statement unanimously in one voice that said, in part, the current rhetoric is leading us to construct a modern false idol out of power and privilege. We, that is the bishops, reject the idolatrous notion that we can ensure the safety of some by sacrificing the hopes of others. No matter where we fall on the political spectrum, we must respect the dignity of every human being and we must seek the common good above all else. It is with that charge and with the fervent hope for another way that this evening was conceived. Relationships matter, and we are grateful for the opportunity that events such as this afford us as we honor one another. This evening will consist of three parts. First, Greg Rickle and Arsalan Bukhari will share their individual reflections with us. Then they will have a conversation between them embodying the friendship and the values for civil discourse which they so ardently share. We'll then have some time for questions and answers, which will be moderated. If you would like to ask a question, please do so briefly and respectfully. And be sure it's a question, (laughs) avoiding the temptation to pontification. I know the difference. (laughs) Lastly, you're invited to stay on and enjoy some refreshments in the corner of the nave and engage one another in conversation. The cathedral shop has some books appropriate for this uh, venue tonight as well, uh, available. And there are flyers for the ongoing series uh, continuing on Wednesday nights and one on Sunday the 24th. We commend those to you. We'll have them on hand in the back after uh, the, the program. So introductions. Arsalan Bakari is Executive Director for CARE Washington. That is the Council for American Muslim Relations. Motivated by the growing prejudice against Muslims, Bakari started as a volunteer with CARE Washington with a resolve to establish a center for professional Muslim activism in Washington State. He is frequently interviewed by newspapers, radio, and TV venues, local, national, and international, and he speaks eloquently on contemporary social issues, including civil rights, civil engage- civic engagement, media relations, and the American Muslim experience in Seattle. He is an alumnus of the Seattle Police Department's Citizen Academy. He leads local efforts to foster positive relations with law enforcement officials, with elected officials, political appointees, and representatives of various government agencies. Prior to joining CARE, Bukhari was contract administrator at the Boeing Company and an activist in fields of interfaith collaboration and community outreach. He holds a bachelor's degree in business finance from Seattle University. Bishop Greg Rickle was elected the eighth bishop of the Diocese of Olympia in 2007, serving the Episcopal Church in Western Washington. Prior to his election, he served churches in Texas and Arkansas, and you will notice his accent that attests to such. He also worked as a hospital administrator prior to entering seminary. He holds degrees in communications, health services administration, a master's of divinity, and doctor of ministry. Bishop Rickle embraces radical hospitality that welcomes all, no matter where they find themselves on their journey of faith. He envisions a church that is safe and authentic, a community in which to explore God's infinite goodness and grace. Will you join me in welcoming Bishop Greg Rickle and Mr. Arsalan Bukhari. (laughs) 
Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Arslan Bukhari, and I am a, uh, a kid from Seattle. I'm a Broadview Thompson. I'm a proud graduate of Broadview Thompson Elementary School in North Seattle. I uh, grew up in North Seattle, a registered voter, and I'm, on, I'm one of the 41 percent of American Muslims who are um, independent voters. We haven't I haven't decided yet uh, how to vote. So, according to a recent survey, 41 percent of American Muslims were um, are independent voters and uh, in this election, undecided. Uh, my wife, Sabrina and, Sabrina and I have been married for six years. Um, I'm a, uh, I remember growing up, my mom always taught me um, to, to be honest and to work hard and to really give back. And I've sort of made that uh, a, mis uh, a mission in my own life, to give back to society in whatever way I can. And um, when I was working at Boeing, uh, it was to volunteer after, wor after work, and now it's kind of to... Uh, work full-time toward uh, enabling the average American Muslim to uh, realize the American dream as I have been blessed to. Um, back in Broadview Thompson Elementary School uh, many, many years ago, I didn't imagine I would go to SU, get a college degree, and uh, work at Boeing and work for one of the larger uh, American Muslim civil rights organizations, but um, such is the way America works. Um, any kid like myself even can do something in life, I guess. Um, I enjoyed growing up in Seattle. I really, um, really did enjoy growing up in Seattle. Went to Eckstein Middle School and Ingram High School, Seattle University. Um, I enjoyed learning quite a bit about uh, the U.S. military. My, two of my uncles were serving in the U.S. Army. One was in Fort Bragg, uh, South Carolina, and one was in um, JB, well, what's now JBLM, Fort Lewis at that time. And my brother-in-law served in the U.S. Navy, uh, active duty for many years, and he was posted in Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, uh, when he was serving in the Navy. Um, and I myself gave it my own shot and tried to join the uh, Marine Corps when one of the recruiters in my uh, wrestling practice, who dropped into wrestling practice in high school, often told me that they were the first in and last out. So I was like, let me in. Um, I was disqualified, though, because of, I, wore an ortho, I wore orthotics in my feet, and we tried really hard to get um, approval, uh, but it didn't happen, so I uh, couldn't join the Marines uh, back then, but um, still support you know, the people who are serving in the military. Um, there are about 10,000 to 20,000 American Muslims who serve in our nation's armed forces, according to the Department of Defense. Um, about Many thousands serve in the, in the various law enforcement agencies. Uh, just in the NYPD, there are about 980, 980 uh, American Muslims police officers in the NYPD um, itself. Uh, and many thousands, in fact, 50,000 uh, approximately, American Muslims are medical doctors across the country. Uh, out of the 900,000 total medical doctors in the country, that's one out of 18 medical doctors who's an American Muslim. Um, so clearly a community that's shown to be dedicated to service to our nation, uh, to, to giving back to our society, and one that's fully invested in making our nation um, stronger uh, with their own work and with their own um, giving back as their everyday life. Um, many American Muslims have given the ultimate sacrifice to our nation uh, while serving in just the last 15 years of combat missions. Uh, Captain Humayu Khan is one you might have heard about uh, Hillary Clinton talk about. She, she told his story at one of her campaign stops and how he was um, in Iraq in 2004 when his, uh, he's, he's a U.S. Army captain. Uh, an orange taxi came into his place. He told his guys to move back. He kind of moved forward to see what was going on. And the uh, taxi blew up, and he lost his life. Um, he had wanted to come back to the U.S. after serving um, uh, and, and wanted to go to law school afterward. Uh, his father, uh, at his memorial in Arlington Cemetery, also mentioned um, that this young man had uh, grown up, wanted to be, uh, to be able to serve, and uh, beyond his military service, serve as a um, civil rights lawyer. Uh, he, of course, didn't realize that dream. He lost his life serving our nation back in 2004. Um, A couple of things I'll share about just American Muslims also that I was hoping to um, serve as, as, as motivation also to you is that American Muslims are part of society. So I think what you'll find often is that many persons who are your coworkers, your students, if you're a teacher, or your neighbors um, may not appear to be Muslim, but they might, but they are. Uh, many of them are, in fact. Um, so about many thousands are public school teachers, many thousands are nurses, and many more. Um, someone had asked a good question about how to build relationships with local Muslims in your areas. Um, so a couple things to keep in mind. Number one, um, you know, again, they're Americans like everyone else, uh, but many do have, uh, based on, of course, their, um, how advanced they are in life or 
uh, if they're immigrants or born and raised here, uh, may have different sensibilities. So you might encounter people who are um, less than fluent in English in some er- uh, in some times, but most American Muslims are U.S. citizens, 81% are, in fact, and are fairly fluent in English. A couple of things to keep in mind is that more observant people who are maybe more religious, religiously observant may not make physical contact with a person of the opposite gender. So a smile still goes a long way, no matter who it is. Uh, but if you think a person might be more observant and may not want to shake your hand, the easy rule of thumb is um, to just have them extend their hand first. And if they do, then you're fine you're good to go there. Uh, We often get a lot of questions about that. Again, for most people, it's not a big deal, but there are many persons who are more observant and um, may not uh, make physical contact with a person of the opposite gender as an expression of their modesty, uh, as their personal expression of modesty. We're also seeing a lot of uh, troubling times today, right? We're seeing a lot of commentary, uh, not just from political leaders, but we're also seeing it from mainstream uh, Headlines, in mainstream headlines. If you look, read the New York Times, the Seattle Times, um, CNN, MSNBC, notice I didn't say Fox News or Democracy Now. They're maybe not mainstream, but mainstream. P- you know, those who pride themselves to be the um, newspapers of record. We're seeing words that are considered defamatory and, in fact, insults by the average Muslim person. Uh, so one, one common one is where you don't see... Um, uh, you know, the, the, the race or the religion or the ethnicity for any other group to describe a crime. You don't see black this or Latino that or Jewish that, um, that being a criminal act. But you see Islamic this or Muslim that almost every day, uh, almost every day in mainstream headlines, mainstream headlines, not on the fringes. Um, and you see that in commentary. So recently we saw some research by the National Hispanic Media Coalition, uh, the University of Exeter and the University of Hawaii, which showed that media content can have um, an effect on prejudice against a certain group. Um, it makes sense, but now we have research to prove it. Uh, it found that you know loaded coverage, as you can imagine, loaded coverage causes biases, and accurate coverage can help people understand things more accurately. Um, what we have seen in the last couple of years has been something that has never been seen in American history ever before. Uh, in 2015, our offices nationwide, uh, CARE is a civil rights organization, we do casework, so our offices nationwide received uh, almost daily reports of hate crimes against persons who were Muslims or were perceived as Muslim. So all of 2015, that's one per day on average received by some office in the country to some from some person in the country. Um, dozens of mosques were burned. Dozens of uh, Sikh temples, Hindu temples were attacked. Uh, many people were shot. Um, a few killed. So not only was the number higher than ever before in American history last year in 2015, but the severity was higher than ever before in history that we have seen. One example um, is a little bit graphic, but it kind of shows the severity of these attacks in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Grand Rapids is Michigan, a man who was not Muslim himself, but was perceived as such apparently, um, a guy came into his store and put a rifle in his mouth, and he told him that he used to kill people like him in Iraq, and he uh, shot him through his mouth. Uh, the only reason why the guy lived is because he turned his cheek to his right, and the bullet went through his left cheek. Um, that he, you know, he came running back to his, um, uh, his uh, store or counter. This was all caught on sort of a camera at his store and then called the cops. And he survived. But it, you know, it was a close call and it kind of shows the severity of these crimes um, increasing like never before last year. So one per day on average, um, severity like never seen before. Uh, it's not surprising because, again, we're seeing also an increase in rhetoric last year, all throughout last year, uh, including late 2014. Uh, things that you would find... Um, you know, uh, editors would never run in opinion sections of papers around African Americans, Latino Americans, Jewish Americans. They found perfectly fine to run in opinion sections about American Muslims. Um, myths that, that are based in no fact, uh, myths that are proven false, uh, are run almost every day across the country in opinion sections and often quoted uh, in news articles. And of course, then the average person is going to be afraid and is going to respond negatively to their American neighbor who are Muslim or who might not be Muslim. The good news is we all have a lot of power. We all have a lot of power. If all of us, most of us, have email, most of us have a cell phone, uh, most of us can write a couple of lines or a paragraph maybe even, right? Um, If you can do that, you have a lot of power. You have the power to educate millions of people with just a few lines. And the the way you can do that is send a simple email uh, with a couple of paragraphs And that's all it is. The fancy word for that is letters to editors, but they're not really letters anymore. They're just simple emails with a couple of paragraphs and with your thoughts. 
and sending uh, and you can do that by sending an email, simple email, to letters at seattletimes.com or letters at nytimes.com or to your local neighborhood newspaper, um, a simple email from your cell phone or from your laptop reminding the public of American values of religious freedom and telling a story of someone that you might know as a neighbor, as a coworker, who is a Muslim person, telling that story and using that power of the pen that you have to educate two million people, which is what um, the, the number of people who read the Seattle Times every day. Um, or 80,000 some people who read the Spokesman Review and the Tri-City Herald and uh, about 40, 50,000 who read the, the News Tribune every day. So you have a lot of power. I mean, don't despair. There's a lot of things that are going on in our world, but every single one of us has the power to educate 2 million people with a single email. And I'll give you a little um, inside scoop on this as well. Uh, in our conversations with letters editors, in the Seattle Times, you have a, ch- a 1 in 10 chance of getting published. So if you send a, t- a thoughtful letter, a thoughtful email, you have a 1 in 10 chance of getting published. They get a lot of, you know, not very reasonable emails. But if you send a thoughtful one, 1 in 10 chance of getting published being read by 2 million people. You won't be able to find that audience elsewhere unless you're a Seahawks player or a really famous uh, musician. Um, and even then, they're not paying attention to every word you say. In this case, they're reading every word. They might come back and read it again and maybe act on it. So you have a lot of power um, to educate and to motivate people to be their best selves. Um, You all have that power in your hands, in your pockets today, literally. I hope you will exercise that power and use the power that you have to send letters to editors, letters at seattletimes.com, letters at nytimes.com, to again, you know, create that better world that we all speak about. And now we know we have the power to help create that as well. Thank you. So I want to thank you all uh, for being here tonight, too, for what is a very important topic. Uh, Last fall, Arsalan, uh, after quite a bit of patience and waiting, uh, came to see me in my office. And I have to admit to you today, it was at first the perfunctory visit. You know, we go through the motions, the niceties, so we can get on with the stuff that really matters, whatever that is. And in the course of our conversation, I realized how much what he was talking about mattered. Why? Because it was incarnated in him. I could read the concern. I could feel it in him. These weren't just ideas for him. They were real and, in some sense, life and death. And I had a bit of a conversion there. I realized that the issues and problems he was talking about were my problems too. And the reason I'm standing before you today is I believe they're yours, ours, together. I haven't been often asked this, which is kind of amazing, really, but when I am asked, what is your favorite part of Scripture, I cite Galatians chapter 3. It is here we read Paul saying, For you are all sons of God in Christ Jesus through the faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ, clothe yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male and female. For all of you are one person in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed heirs according to the promise. And I love that so much because it breaks down all the barriers by naming the most prevalent barriers in Galatia and in the society of the time of Paul's writing. And when I would teach the letters of Paul, I would often encourage my students to replace those barriers with those that exist today, gay and straight, black and white, 99% and 1%, Muslim and Christian, Jew and Muslim. Paul was not suggesting that all distinctions could be erased in our world, but he was suggesting for Christians that this world was now secondary, and even if those distinctions were true in this world, they were not true any longer in the body of Christ. That's a bold statement. It's one we have found very difficult to follow. It reminds me of G.K. Chesterton's quote that 
It isn't really that Christianity is that bad, it's just that no one has really tried it yet. <clears throat> There's some truth in that because it's difficult. In the Diocese of Olympia, I selected as our Lenten book Rabbi Jonathan Sachs' book, Not in God's Name, Confronting Religious Violence. He makes a remarkable case in this book. If you read it, you know this, that the real story of the break that we so often point to actually ends with God making a pretty remarkable and huge statement. I reject rejection. I reject rejection. There will be no more of this. Sachs calls the rift between Islam, Judaism, and Christianity sibling rivalry. And he says that it's always a case of the younger believing it has prevailed over the elder. Just track history, it happens again and again. As he puts it, between them, that's not simply a conflict between different systems of thought and ways of life. It is rather an intense sibling rivalry. Each regards itself the heir to the covenant with Abraham and is willing to fight for it. Which brings me back to Galatians. It does not say Christians are the only heirs, just that we are also heirs. Sachs makes a case for an alternative to the sibling rivalry narrative that is so often the core of the relationship between Judaism, Islam, and Christianity and also the source of much, if not all, of the religious violence throughout history. Sibling rivalry, as he puts it, as a contest for divine love is a bad idea and wrongly diminishes Abraham's God. It is a misportrayal of that God. The truth that shines through the Genesis text is that we are each blessed by God each precious in his sight, each with our role in God's story, each with our own song in the music of humankind. And then he goes on to say what for me was the best quote of the book, and if you've had to listen to me in Lent and after, you've heard me say it many, many times. To be a child of Abraham is to learn to respect the other children of Abraham, even if their way is not ours, their covenant not ours, their understanding of God different from ours. We know that we are loved. Every one of our faiths assures us of that, and that must be enough. To insist that being loved entails that others be unloved is to fail to understand love itself. It's to fail to understand love itself. Now, I think we cannot stand here honestly tonight without admitting that each faith, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity, have a long way to go within themselves to point out, to speak out, and to denounce the extremism that exists within each of them, and it does. If we don't do that, we're not being truthful, and I would even go farther to say we're not being faithful. But I will say it clearly, to denounce a whole people a whole faith, to denounce Islam or Judaism in that way is not right, and for me it is not Christian. The Quran and the Bible teach us to be honest. The Quran and the Bible teach us to bear true witness. Our bloodlines are actually the same. The lineage in the Bible reflecting much the same in the Quran. Muslims also learn from and believe in a chain of prophets named Adam, Noah, Abraham, Ishmael, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Job, Moses, Aaron, David, Solomon, Elias, Jonah, John the Baptist, Jesus. You all heard of any of them? I might be so bold to say that we're part of the same dysfunctional family. But we are inescapably family. Back at that meeting last year with Arsalan, in the middle of it, like I stated earlier, I can't explain it, but I finally felt connected to this issue of Islamophobia 
And it was a connection that went beyond words. And it called me to action. Some of that was brought on not just by Arsalan's visit, but even more by the rhetoric that I was beginning to hear in our political process and what I believed to be a moment when, like not many of recent memory, I was most disappointed in my fellow citizens. I'm concerned about the overwhelming appeal to our lesser selves. Call me crazy, but this is just how other regrets of our national history began, all of which remain a wound today. First Nation displacement, Japanese internment, mistreatment of immigrants, slavery, all began in the same way, with fear and the demonizing of the other. And so I invited Arsalan into a conversation. And I asked him to bring others, Muslim brothers and sisters, who would be willing to share and be in conversation too. And our video series grew out of that. We wanted to find a way to avoid what is so easy for us to do, to demonize the unknown, to keep ourselves apart, to retreat into what we know, and instead to begin the walk toward one another. Who I met were amazing people, faithful people, Americans with the same dreams, hopes, aspirations for their families, just as we have. I saw fear in their eyes. After the statement about deporting Muslims, one told me she was keeping her bags packed now, literally, out of fear. That one day soon, They'd have to go. It was the same in Nazi Germany. Exactly the same. If I would encourage you to do anything tonight, it is this. Get off your duff and go meet your Muslim neighbors. Find them. Have a conversation. Get to know them. That will make this an incarnational reality, not an abstraction, which I do believe is one of our biggest problems right now. Conversations such as those and the one we hope for tonight are the beginning. Such efforts, action, change, often do start with words. But I hope, and I know Arsalan hopes it too, that we move beyond words. Oscar Romero once spoke of this. He said, it's very easy to be servants of the word without disturbing the world. A very spiritualized word, a word without any commitment to history, a word that can sound in any part of the world because it belongs to no part of the world. A word like that creates no problems. It starts no conflicts. What starts conflicts and persecutions, what marks the genuine church is the word that burning like the word of the prophets proclaims and accuses, proclaims to the people God's wonders to be believed and venerated, and accuses of sin those who oppose God's reign so that they may tear that sin out of their hearts, out of their societies, out of their laws, out of the structures that oppress, that imprison, that violate the rights of God and of humanity. This is the hard service of the word. A church that doesn't provoke any crisis, a gospel that doesn't unsettle, a word of God that doesn't get under anyone's skin, a word of God that doesn't touch the real sin of the society in which it is being proclaimed. What gospel is that? Some want to keep a gospel so disembodied that it doesn't get involved at all in the world it's been called to save. This is what I was still doing when Arslan walked into my office that day. I was reading a disembodied gospel. Arslan, through simple conversation, through reaching out, through being present, through being courageous, 
to walk into my office, gave it incarnation, embodied it. So tonight what we want to start is what Romero calls the hard service of the word. An incarnational embodied conversation that takes us from complacency to action, from talk to work, from distant compassion to engaged connection. May it be so. I'm going to serve you a softball. Sure. Uh, if people here wanted to do what I say, which usually they don't, so I'll just tell you that right now, but mm-hmm. let's say they did, and they wanted to go visit a mosque, mm-hmm. what would be the easiest way for them to do that, do you think? Sure. So the first step could be a couple of things. If you have a coworker um, or a classmate or someone who's a Muslim person, you can just hang out with them, and they might go to a mosque for a potluck on a Saturday night or a Sunday night um, or Friday night. Or they might have kids who go to Sunday school, so you can just hang out with them. Mosques are open to people of all faiths, so it's not a members-only place. That's one way. The other way is, if you don't know a person who is Muslim, uh, you can go to islamicfinder.org. Islamicfinder.org. You can punch in your zip code anywhere in the country um, and find a mosque within, you know, you can choose within 5 miles, 10 miles, 15 miles, and... um, it's a safe bet to say that most Sundays, you know, from 10 a.m. till about 1 or 2 p.m., you'll have Sunday school and a lot of parents and kids there, and you can find uh, people to socialize with and get to know. Um, most weeknights, uh, except Friday night, so Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday nights, um, you know, after 5 p.m. or so, you'll see a lot of kids and parents around because they have evening Quran classes in almost every mosque. Um, so you can just drop in and say hi and meet people there. Um, of course, there's Friday prayers, which happen uh, at about, you know, this time of the year, about 12.30 or so until about 1.30, so you can drop in at that time. So Sunday school, late morning, uh, evenings on weekday, weeknights, and um, Friday prayers are times that if you live near a mosque or if you just drive over to a mosque, you're sure to find a good crowd and, again, drop in, say hello. Uh, they're not for members only. People of all faiths can, can drop in and say hi, and they welcome visitors. So... That's the first step you can take. Um, Islamicfinder.org? Is Islamicfinder.org, yes. Correct. Sounds like a dating site. Yeah, it does. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay. Uh, so uh, one that I'm very familiar with is MAPS, uh, mm-hmm. which is the Muslim Association of Puget Sound, right? It's in Correct. Redmond? It's in Redmond. Mm-hmm. Uh, I understand it's, I think, I was told it's the largest mosque mm-hmm. on the West Coast. Uh, yeah, uh, maybe by... So people that are associated with it? Yeah, know, certainly the Northwest for sure. It's the, yeah. by far the largest in the Northwest. And uh, I was honored to be asked to, when they dedicated that, to, to be the Christian representative and uh, got to tour it. And if I remember right, they're very dedicated to education about Islam and hold classes and many things. I mean, that would be a place that people could go as well, right? Very easily, yeah. And, and their website, again, I'll give a lot of websites tonight. So uh, Maps Redmond. M-A-P-S, redmond.org, and people can find their, um, of course, their address, and uh, they're pretty good at keeping the website up to date, so they'll ha- they have a lot of events. I mean, they're the biggest in the Northwest and have lots of programs, so many opportunities for people of all faiths to just drop in and um, socialize and get to know people in your neighborhood. Yeah, if you watch the video series, there's, uh, I think we actually film there, uh, interfaith class uh, with Muslims and Christians present. Uh, and learning from one another. So that's a very good place to go. And I would say it's just a very interesting place, period, because uh, they took a what was a warehouse, I think, and renovated it, a huge space, into a, just a beautiful space. So they kind of took a part of Redmond and actually uh, made it beautiful. And uh, uh, the day I was there, the mayor was there. I thought it was great. I'm not saying anything about Redmond, I promise. <laughs> So uh, I thought, uh, in light of what you were saying, too, and what you do, every day, well, one thing I never ask you, mm-hmm. I was thinking this, and maybe you're willing to share this, is what sure. made you go from Boeing to this? Good question. So, uh, Were you, uh, yeah. you know, what happened? Yeah, so I, uh, I'll take it back a little bit farther. So in college, um, 
I, uh, my dream was to be like Warren Buffett, and I was pretty bold at that time, and I used to tell people that. Um, and most of my internships were in investments and, and consulting. And uh, the reason I took Boeing was because it was a three-year management rotation program. Um, and I guess the idea was that if you do well in those three years and rotate through different departments, you might become a manager. And so as a, as a college student, I was like, well, I'll take that. And I'll <laughs> wait till later for maybe investments. And um, the first, I think, rotation was in the IDS, the, the defense unit of, of Boeing, which makes... Uh, many things that are being used right now in combat, and um, you know, didn't enjoy it too much. And I just left Boeing, uh, not to join Care, but just to look for jobs in investments. And while I was doing that, I started volunteering more. So while I was working at Boeing, I volunteered in the evenings at the mosque in Mount Terrace and a few more places, shelters in the Af in the on the weekends. Uh, while I was searching for uh, for uh, an investment job, I started volunteering more. And they had a Care um, workshop on civil rights in Northgate. I remember, and so I took some friends and attended that workshop. At the end, they said they wanted volunteers to join, so I said, okay, I'll join for a couple of weekends or so, or a couple of hours a weekend, and um, kind of grew from there, kind of mm -hmm. fell in love with the work, and it was addressing systems issues, and that's yeah. what I appreciated most about it, is that it addresses systems that cause things to happen, and um, I was, uh, I applied for a job then at the office in Seattle um, in 09, and was accepted, and have been on staff since 2009. Okay. And tell a little bit more about what CARE does. Like, what's day-to-day -day work? Yeah, good question. So, you know, I think um, we're a national civil rights organization. We have about 25 offices, uh, one in most major cities. And uh, we're mainly a civil rights organization, which means we do casework. So last year, our office in Seattle received about three, more than 350 cases, which really range from everything from taunting to bullying of kids in school to mm -hmm. hate crimes. Mm -hmm. And... Um, they involve law enforcement profiling, someone told they can't work because they have a headscarf. Any kind of case that involves a person who is Muslim or perceived as Muslim, uh, we actually do whatever it takes to resolve that case. Um, so most of our work is case work. We have three staff members in our Seattle office who work on those cases and a couple of interns who help them. Uh, and the other part of our mission is to educate the wider public um, through interfaith work to events like this one but more and more through having uh, everyday people from the Muslim community and allies, good people like yourself, mm -hmm. fair-minded people, to, talk, to tell their story to the, um, the wider public mm -hmm. through media interviews and letters to editors. And lastly, our job also is to empower the American Muslim community by training them on political engagement, how to find your lawmaker, how to meet with your lawmaker, and how to write a basic letter to the editor like I kind of quickly showed you how to do. <laughs> so um, civil rights work, political <clears throat> engagement, and um, public okay. education. Right. Is there any way you could uh, share maybe one complaint that's come in without you sure. know, betraying confidences or anything? But yeah. as an example, maybe a recent one to just say mm. this happens all the time, you know? Uh, yeah, you know. Because you've uh, told me about some of those. Maybe there's one you could share. Yeah. So, again, what was unique about last year is that nationwide we received more hate crimes than ever before. I'll tell you one story of one in, here in Seattle, in fact. Uh, so December 9th, December 9th of last year, an African-American Christian man was um, driving an Uber car, and he picked up his ride from, or the people from West Seattle, uh, near Fauntleroy Avenue, mm -hmm. and took the, was going to take them to downtown Seattle. And, you know, he spoke English with an accent. He was not Muslim himself. Uh, and the people started calling him names that we, again, usually hear on TV and radio all the time, the T word, the J word, other words. Um, and then they beat him up pretty badly on First and Seneca and just took off. Uh, luckily, they were arrested, and um, now they're facing prosecution. Uh, so that was one case uh, that we received. Um, the gentleman, um, you know, went home that night. He luckily called the cops and was able to find the person, and he went home, and his daughter was speaking to our staff. I remember I kind of overheard the conversation when I met with him after I met with him, uh, that, you know, she was crying. She saw her dad come home late at night with his face, you know, um, looking different than he, look, he looked when he left the house. Uh, and she's, I think, 12 years old, his one of his daughters is. So that's the sort of the impact that these sorts of things have. And again, they, this is just one more story that shows it's not just Muslim persons, but really anyone who might appear as, in some way to someone as Muslim. And um, the things people are hearing out there are affecting the way they behave toward people who might be Muslim or are Muslim. Are we still, I know you uh, had some <clears throat> reports from the airport uh, about airlines. Is that still happening? You, I mean, uh, you know, with pulling people off planes and things like that? Or? Yeah, so that's uh, a common one, unfortunately, um, nationwide especially, where, you know, a passenger feels unsafe because someone is speaking in a foreign language or just looks uh, to them in 
you know, uh, like a threat. And often it is because of the way they look or the religion they might be perceived as. Uh, so recently, I think United, United Airlines um, had a father, father, mother, and their elementary school age three kids get off an airplane. I think it was in Chicago or New York um, because some passenger slipped a note and said they don't feel safe with them on the airplane. And, uh, you know, they said, well, why? And uh, they had no other reason to think about why that happened except maybe the mom wore a headscarf and they um, are darker complexioned and other things. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's happening. Uh, that is happening often. I mean, last year, those sorts of complaints were about, uh, well, I, I would say at least 30 or so complaints our offices nationwide received um, of those kinds where mm-hmm. people were told to get off an airplane and either the language they spoke or something religious or ethnic or racial was appeared to be the trigger for that. Yeah. So, so uh, you know, this, I'm, I'm going to venture to guess because I know a lot of these people, they're, they're, uh, this is a Christian crowd, you know. Okay. So. That makes sense. Uh, but, I mean, uh, what would, uh, like, uh, Muslims in Seattle generally, and I'm, I know this is a difficult question, a hard question, maybe it's unfair, I'm going to ask it anyway. Sure. I mean, what, what's the view of Christianity? Yeah. Like, I mean, what, what are things that you hear mm-hmm. are the view of Christianity or Christians uh, from the Muslim community in Seattle? Yeah, so by and large, I think, what, as you mentioned in your sermon, in your uh, speech, um, Islam and Christianity and Judaism have a lot in common. So what everyday Muslims also recognize is that, you know, there's many thousands, among Muslims, I mean, there's tens of thousands of prophets uh, and messengers um, that came between Adam and Muhammad, Muslims believe. Adam being the first, Muhammad being the last, mm-hmm. and the ones you mentioned and many more. So uh, Christians and Jews and um, others are considered people of the book. So Muslims believe that you know, the Gospels were revealed as a divine text to Jesus, um, the Torah to uh, Moses, the books to Abraham, the Psalms to David. Um, mm-hmm. So they're considered people of the book, people who are, you know, received God's word and um, believe in the one God and his messengers and his yeah. book. Is there a... Uh... Is there a Christian antagonist mm-hmm. to Islam in Seattle? Christian antagonist. Well, like a, one that's notorious for being against Islam, is that? Oh, well, you know, there's, there's a lot of people who are um, misled. So, mm-hmm. you know, they, they range from politicians to candidates to religious leaders to uh, mm-hmm. opinion writers to others. Um, and, you know, our job is to help them understand. Because, you know, really what we find every time is that when people get to know a local Muslim family or a person, mm-hmm. um, they can't help but understand that they are their fellow American. Mm-hmm. We find that across the board all the time. I mean, um, we've had meetings with lawmakers across the state for that very reason. And we did target lawmakers who are maybe less f- familiar, let's just say in a way, uh, with American Muslims and Islam. Mm-hmm. And what we find every single time is that when they meet families and they get to know about their lives and their contributions and their hopes and dreams for their kids, mm-hmm. um, they understand that these are fellow Americans. They have the ho- same hopes and dreams. Um, they're part of our society. They, our futures are intertwined. Mm-hmm. So that's really what we focus on is yeah. um, helping people understand. So great. Good. So you're ready to take some questions? Absolutely. Yeah. All right. We're going to open it up to you. And I think we have a person with a mic. And uh, we would love for you to stand up and say who you are. And I'll remind you of the dean's quest. That it be a question, <laughs> and somewhat brief, and we'll answer it, or we'll try. We've got the first one, all right? There's one right back there. Hi, uh, this is for Arsalan. Um, my question is, uh, do you have any kind of outreach program in the public schools? Good question. So, uh, not a proactive one at a scale that we would wish to have. But Jasmine Sami, who is our brilliant civil rights uh, manager, Jasmine Sami leads our civil rights department. Um, she's been receive- our office has been receiving a number of calls from uh, schools where kids have been called names, often by fellow students, but many times by teachers, and many times in front of other students. Um, and not much corrective action is taken. Um, so nothing proactive. We'd, we'd love to have that, and I'd be happy to connect you with, our, with Jasmine and give you her business card. Um, to have more pro- proactive outreach to school districts and have people, again, under- understand, uh, based on facts, who Muslims are and maybe understand the impact that it can have on a kid if you called them the T word in class, like what happened in, in a school district in southwest Washington a few months ago. Um, but we'd love okay. to scale it up more and we'd love to have your help. Yeah. Questions? <clears throat> 
Thank you. Thank you both for the courage to have a conversation across difference. Um, I, I heard you talk about your organization and the three pillars that you focus on with regards to civil rights, education, and politics. And I, I, I'm curious um, what your discussions have been in the private sector, as the private sector has boldly stepped into civil rights with marriage equality, what's going on in North Carolina with pay equality. How are you engaging the private sector as an ally? Mm -hmm. It's a very good question. I think the same answer as the one from before. I think it needs to be scaled up much more. Um, so I think it's fairly limited to those who have a significant number of Muslim employees, so Microsoft, Amazon, and those types. And even that is sort of just, you know, helping them um, ensure that their coworkers are uh, you know, aware of uh, Islamic practices, especially around the time of Ramadan when Muslims uh, fast from sunup till sundown, just basic things like that. But it needs to be scaled up much more uh, at, at a, to bring them to a place where they're advocates working alongside civil rights organizations. Right here. Okay. We'll get Thank you for coming. Uh, I had a question. I think one of the stumbling blocks that I and others have with Islam is the treatment of women. And I um, was curious if you could comment on that. I think there's actually some misunderstanding, as I understand the Prophet Muhammad actually helped um, uh, with the status of women in the culture at that time. And, and also, I think a lot of Christians don't realize there's a chapter in the Quran about Mary, the mother of Jesus. And I, I just wonder uh, if there's a way to, to bridge, that that may be a bridge between Christianity and Islam. So. That's a good question, and it's a common one because I think um, people do have a lot of questions uh, because, you know, uh, there's a lot of things you see uh, all happening all around the world that are really unfortunate and un-Islamic un uh, that are happening uh, to women. So, you know, what we see often on TV, I remember many years ago in Afghanistan, um, remnants of pre-Islamic tribal culture still exist in many countries across the world. Uh, domestic violence is a big deal, uh, is, a, is, a, is a very serious issue across the world, including... Uh, other countries. Um, so, w what is, so what Islam teaches, I'll tell you, and then, of course, you might not find that being practiced elsewhere, so that's a challenge. Um, but what Islam teaches, and I think what you alluded to, is that um, Prophet Muhammad, when he, brought, when he preached Islam uh, to people at, in the 7th century, um, the basic rights that were, given to, that were given to women who are Muslim, and uh, they were asked to practice, not just allowed, but asked to practice, were to do basic things like own property, inherit property, um, to be able to uh, enter into contracts, you know, just basic things that you, you know, own a business, um, initiate a marriage, initiate divorce, um, you know, make decisions about their lives. And uh, that was, you know, started back then, back in the 7th century when it was revolutionary to do that. Um, many governments today uh, have a lot of restrictions. So Saudi Arabia's law about not driving for, uh, or women not being able to drive is stumps a lot of, well, most Islamic scholars. You know, they can't find anything in Islamic script, in, in the scripture or the Quran or the prophetic teachings about that because um, women back then, well, they didn't have cars, but they had, you know, horses and other things, and they rode them to get around. Uh, so, you know, those sorts of things are uh, puzzling even to Muslim scholars. Why does Saudi Arabia have that law? Um, but Islamic practices, you know, allow for women to do those things. Um, and you see that sort of in practice. So when you go beyond Saudi Arabia, when you go to Malaysia or Brunei or Ivory Coast or uh, many other countries where it's 90% some Muslim populations, you see women owning businesses, working, doing everyday things. Um, and often what you do see happening is, again, a function of the culture and the economic conditions in, that one co in those countries. Um, in, in the U.S., for example, or in Britain, uh, in the U.S., I can speak for that at least, um, American Muslim women are the second highest educated uh, religious group of women in the U.S., according to the Gallup poll. And they found, at least back in 2009, they were as likely as American Muslim men to have a bachelor's degree or higher. And um, the wage gap between Muslim women and Muslim men in the U.S. was, they found, nearly non-existent. Um, so there's a few sort of factoids, I guess, about American Muslim women. Um, and so, so that, that's a, hopefully a, a response. I might have missed a portion of your question that you had asked. Um, Mary. Ah, yes. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I think the British Christianity, again, if you read the chapter of Mary, um, which is there, it, it um, details the, the virgin birth and her, the situation she faced when she was um, found to be carrying the people. I'm not sure if the Bible story is similar, but the people of her town, you know, were going to put her on trial for adultery, and then she had to go out to the, to the woods. Um, there's also the story of Joseph, the story of uh, Jonah um, and the fish. There's also 
many more stories that you'll find in the Bible that are also in the Quran, the story of Noah, um, a chapter called Noah, and many more that are also in the Quran. I wanted to follow up on this uh, question. It's a good one. I'm glad you asked it. Um, <clears throat> and I'd want to say to the Christian uh, here, which are most of you, uh, to think about the fact, and, and I think it's hard for us to think about this, that many people in the world will also look at Christianity and say that it's this way because they have a view of it <laughs> that gets portrayed a certain way in the media or whatever. And, uh, you know, it's just not as interesting to say, well, there's not that many differences. It's more interesting to say, here's where all the differences are. Uh, I remember where this came to me in such a striking way was uh, being invited in Austin, Texas, to go to a, a synagogue uh, by a rabbi friend. And uh, he asked me to come and to uh, speak to their congregation, much like we're doing tonight. And... I ask one question, you know, will you be honest with me and tell me your view of Christianity? When you hear the word Christian, what do you see? What do you... And I was appalled <laughs> by what I got back, you know. Uh, and I, I think that that's uh, just indicative of the distance between us still and uh, how much we don't know uh, often about ourselves uh, and certainly the little we know about the other face, too. And I think it's important for us to, to be careful with that vision as the vision uh, because I think Islam is just like Judaism, is just like Christianity. There's a wide spectrum of practice and belief. And so. Thank you for um, your thoughtful comments this evening and for bringing us all together. I'm wondering if you could each speak a little bit about... Um, institutional initiatives that are going on locally to facilitate this bridge building that's so necessary within our community, locally, and more broadly? Institutional, private, public, religious, it doesn't yes. matter to you. Okay, all right, yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I'd answer it first by saying, uh, for us, the initiative was to try to do this video series, uh, which I spoke about in the talk. I mean, it came to me when Arslan was uh, with us that uh, simple questions like the one he addressed, I actually talked to him the first day, and then uh, Anila, who's in the uh, videos, if you watched, who's a local attorney, Muslim, uh, I asked her this, that simple question. I said, I know it sounds absurd, but many, many, especially I think Christian men would ask, if I see a Muslim woman walking down the street, what's the proper way to greet her? What's the, you know, uh, to not do her dishonor? Or, uh, you know, and that's just even a scary question to ask. <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it's a cumbersome, embarrassing question to ask, which she handled so well. She said, well, smile always works, and yes, you're going to encounter some who don't want to uh, touch, and, you know, you just got to kind of follow that. But, uh, you know, it's, I thought... It's not a huge institutional program, but for us, I thought it was important to to put the word out, to show us having this conversation, and to talk about what it is for us to be neighbors to our uh, Muslim neighbors. And so I would say that's our initiative right now. I think Arslan can speak to maybe the other ones he's aware of, that, but I would I would say that that's one that is truly an initiative on our part right now. And thank you for doing that also, Bishop Rickle. I think, uh, how many of you have you seen the videos that he had made, the three videos that you sent? Okay. So I think he set the example, really. I think we shared that with our chapters nationwide to have them do things like that because I think what we found through public opinion research is that when people hear their religious leaders, in, in the case of Christ, you know, the majority of the country is Christian uh, of some denomination, when they hear a bishop uh, talk about uh, their Muslim neighbor and sit down with a Muslim person, whether it be Anila as a accomplished lawyer or just an everyday mom like you did with mm -hmm. um, Ms. Gobana mm -hmm. and Mr. H uh, Haj Haidari. Uh, that goes a long way toward helping people understand that we are all Americans when they see people sitting there and sort of personifying that, right? Uh, so thank you for doing that and um, that's an important initiative. I was checking my cell phone, not because I was te checking my text messages, but um, it's a website called uh, standingtogether2016.com. 
So standingtogether2016.com. And that's the initiative that is um, uh, sort of a traveling um, meetings in various houses of worship in the Seattle area. And I think in a couple of days they're meeting at a mosque and then they'll be meeting at a church and then a synagogue and a different mosque and a different church and different synagogue. And they bring in a good number of people and they have good, you know, mm-hmm. uh, vibrant discussions. So standingtogether2016.com is a local initiative and they have periodic uh, gatherings for people to get to know each other and they build relationships that way and they hope that that's simply a springboard for people to then to go um, pursue those relationships farther. There's also a national initiative called uh, sh- the Shoulder to Shoulder Campaign or Shoulder to Shoulder um, Initiative uh, at the national level where they pair churches and, and, and mosques uh, and synagogues um, mostly to fa- fight what was happening and still is happening is opposition to mosques by local activist groups. Uh, so the Shoulder to Shoulder Campaign came out as a response to that to have interfaith leaders stand up and go to city councils while they're being yelled at by people and telling them to shut down the mosque and not give them a permit to have people of faith who are fair-minded people to tell them, hey, this is a, a basic religious right that we all have. Um, but th- that's not evolved more to have, uh, to go beyond just simply advocating to make sure that mosques who want a permit get a permit. Uh, and there's many more, but those, those are the ones that come to mind. There's also a very good one by Catacomb Churches. Um, mm-hmm. And they're sort of the same way as the Standing Together one where they have kind of a traveling um, set of uh, gatherings that happen in different churches and mosques across the Puget Sound, in fact. So they go up pretty far to Bellingham and all the way down to Olympia, I think, as well. So you yeah. can join those initiatives and attend those events. That last one he just mentioned is uh, Terry Kyla, who uh, is a Lutheran priest, but he's actually heading up an Episcopal church in Marysville. And it's been really... Uh, hiding out as an Episcopalian for the last 15 years, really. So, uh, uh, But he's a wonderful priest, and he's kind of really r- right in the middle of that one. So, Saturday, April 24th? Sunday, April 24th. I mean, April 24th. Yeah, great. Okay. Uh, sir, did that get at what you were asking? Yeah, okay. Uh, questions and uh, how about back there right by you? Thank you both for your presentation and for the talk. I think it's really important. Um, we've talked a lot about here about uh, Abrahamic religions and I was wondering if CARE and uh, St. Mark's have done initiatives towards non-Abrahamic religions and if there's work out there um, among the Buddhists and Hindus and all sorts of other there's a lot of religions in the world. Um, i I spent some time in college in India. I learned about the terrible violence in history uh, in the 20th century that inflicted upon Muslims and upon Hindus, which of course was in the wake of a Christian colonialist country um, that left. Um, So, yeah, what about the other religions? Yeah, well, I would just say that Arslan often and I are in meetings with all those other faith uh, representatives uh, I don't know how to put this except to say that <laughs> a lot of them have their act together a little better than the three of us do. So we're, we're having to spend a lot more time together working on this. But, uh, but I think a lot of that does go on. I would say uh, in my first church in Arkansas, the thing I got in the most trouble for uh, was having Buddhist Christian dialogue. And uh, I thought it was going to be the most innocuous uh, thing. And I found out I became the main target of the 800 member Bible study at First Baptist Church in Conway, Arkansas. Like, like I was the target. I was the devil, you know, because I was talking to Buddhists. Uh, and it was the same. I mean, I think it's an interesting question you bring up because in that context it became an issue of actually talking about what Buddhism was, uh, is, and, uh, talk, and, and doing education about that very thing because what people had in their minds versus what it is, totally different. So I would say it's contextual uh, to a degree and uh, we uh, right now, you know, this is uh, an issue that's very, very important to the country, and uh, there needs to be a different 
uh, vision uh, than the one that's being often portrayed, so that's why we're on this one. But I would, I would assure you that much dialogue goes on uh, with the other religions as well. I, you can answer it your way. But, uh. Yeah, so I think um, yeah, maybe we can do more intentional outreach to other faiths. The, the initiatives I mentioned, um, especially Standing Together 2016.com, that one, is uh, I think it includes, they do include, in fact, other faiths, and I think maybe they have a couple of uh, sites that they're, they're going to visit that are, I think, going to be either a Hindu temple in Sammamish or, um, or a Buddhist temple uh, in the area. So, uh, but certainly um, fewer of them versus the churches and synagogues they'll, they'll visit, so maybe more intentional work. Good question. Okay, come up here. There are all these neglected people in the front row. <clears throat> Uh, my question has to do with young people, um, and I'm wondering how uh, the young people who are Muslim uh, and who are facing all these terrible prejudices and predicaments in this country and in others are handling it because it is extremely difficult and you're made to feel like a nobody or somebody who's an enemy. I wonder if you could com I know you can't comment on it by saying, you know, everybody's the same, but it's happening, and uh, I'd like to hear your thoughts on it. Yeah, so it is, it is um, taking a toll on, on a lot of young people, and that's one of my concerns, and I think the next generation, I mean, we can, you know, we can tough it out for the next few years and hope things get, get better over the next few years, but it's the kids who are growing up these days right now. Um, you know, Broadview Elementary School was, Broadview Thompson Elementary School was a pretty easy place to grow up in, right, back when I was a kid. Um, but now these places are not as easy for a lot of kids. Um, schools are doing a, an okay job, but I think uh, because of the environment around us and what's being said all around us, um, a lot of kids are being attacked. And as I mentioned, I mean, it's not just playground bullying type stuff like was the case when we were growing up. It was, it's teachers now who are doing a lot, saying a lot of things. Good teachers and fair-minded teachers, I'm sure, but who have bad information and they're repeating it in the classroom. So, um, you know, we get complaints from kids, and uh, one, one, one I'll, I'll mention is um, happened in a suburb a little bit south of Seattle. A young kid was a... Uh, someone, well, someone called in a bomb threat to a high school in the area, and they blamed on this Muslim kid because, of course, he's Muslim, he would do it, right? That was the presumption the person who accused him of worked with, and the school bought it, and the school um, got him arrested. Uh, well, they called the cops, and they handcuffed him, arrested him, and uh, questioned him without, officer, without his parents or a lawyer for at least a couple of hours, I think it was, and um, left him really traumatized. I mean, can you imagine having that happen? And then, of course, it's a high school, so everyone knows the next day, you know, that he did this or supposedly did this. Uh, the kid who did that, to, who framed him, um, was fine. He didn't get disciplined at all until we stepped in and contacted the school district and said, hey, you've got to do something about this. I mean, this kid is uh, taking anxiety medicine because he had to deal with this whole thing, the Muslim kid who was um, framed with this threat. And um, the person who did this is facing nothing, no discipline. I mean, it's not fair. And so then the school district take, took some action, expelled him, but then, then they had the boy, uh, he, had, he had a girlfriend on campus, so he, they, they let him hang out around the campus because his girlfriend went to school there still, and this boy was afraid because he didn't want this guy around him. Um, so it was a kind of a complex situation, but the main thing was, that, I mean, the fact that this kid had to take anxiety medicine to get over this trauma uh, showed us how, how impactful this sort of stuff can be. That's just one story. I mean, there's many more where um, these sorts of things happen. People have been called names in, by teachers against in front of the whole class. And again, in a school setting, we all remember growing up and how... I mean, the, the social dynamics can be really bad after that, right, that, after that happens, and especially if it's not corrected and fixed. So those are some, some things that we're seeing happening. As far as how kids are dealing with it, um, you know, I can only imagine, I, I'd love to see a study on what can work and what sort of should be done proactively. Uh, you know, we do casework, so we get to hear about these things when they happen, and then we work with that one school, um, and then we hear something from a different school and that we, and we work with that school district. But... Um, I think much more needs to be done proactively um, to help kids deal with this. It's a, these are tough times. And they're, again, uh, they're affecting people who are adults, but the kids are the real issue, uh, you know, concern that we have, the impact on them, because that, is, that can be long-lasting last, on their lives. Okay. I want to 
want to go back to the, the women's issue. I'm a chaplain in a domestic violence center, and when we get a Muslim woman coming in, it is often difficult to convince her that she needs to file for the protection order because she's even in more danger once that happens, especially if it's granted. So are there services, <clears throat> much like your care or something, that we can refer her to, to where she can get the help that understands the whole women's situation, men head of the household and such, uh, it would be really helpful if we could help these women better than we can. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, there are a couple of sources that can have people uh, who might be, uh, have the expertise to be able to deal with that. There's a couple of places. One is um, the MCRC, and their website is uh, mcrcseattle.org, mcrcseattle.org. Uh, MCRC stands for the Muslim Community Resource Center, I think it is. And they're sort of a clearinghouse for all sorts of social services providers. Um, any sort of social services they'll be able to, uh, able to connect you with. There's also an organization called API Chaya, A-P-I-C-H-A-Y-A. -A um, and they also are, have case workers who work on cases like this as well. Uh, and MCRC can also connect with imams who can, from a religious perspective, counsel the, uh, the person you're working with and have her, you know, make the right decisions as well. So. I want to come back to the, uh, the question about the young people, too, that uh, there's a great uh, program that we support called Kids for Peace. And if you're not uh, familiar with it, I would encourage you to look that up. Josh Thomas, who used to be part of our staff and uh, a, a priest in this diocese, has done a lot uh, with that. And uh, uh, we're very involved in it here. Uh, some of the work happens here, but a lot of the work happens in Jerusalem. And uh, Josh is in both places, and it brings uh, youth together and children together from all three faiths uh, and try to put them in environments where they can uh, work and live and uh, play together. And so I uh, would really commend that. Uh, I think it's great work, and... Uh, especially with that generation, I think it's great work. So I didn't want to miss that opportunity to say that. So. It seems like we're in a time of um, extraordinary um, perversion of both Christianity and Islam um, by certain proponents on each side. And um, I don't know, one, why that's so intense right now, and two... It's such a high level and pervasive problem. Is there anything to be done about that to bring the dialogue back to what Christianity and Islam are really about and to give more um, press to that uh, instead of hanging on to um, the hatred of um, Muslim extremists and the hatred of people who um, consider themselves Christians. Um, it's more of a high-level question. Just say no. I mean, we have to say it. We have to, uh, you know, my struggle with uh, resolutions, for instance, in the Episcopal Church, uh, is so often we can pass those and think we've really done something. And so, you know, most of them are written with the Episcopal Church says this, the Episcopal Church says that, which I think it's very interesting because people will ask me, what does the Episcopal Church think about X? And I'll say, well, it doesn't think anything. You know, it's not a person. It's, uh, it's made up of lots of people who think many things. And, you know, the bottom line is the Episcopal Church is turn and look at your neighbor, <laughs> most of you. This is the Episcopal Church. And if it says we're going to do something or we believe something, it's going to be us that has to do it. Uh, it's true, I think, for me that the, uh, uh, you know, it's, the extremism is a lot sexier to the media. So we got an uphill climb on that. Uh, but the reality is we got to start making ourselves heard and being willing to step up and say no <laughs> to versions that are put out there that are not what we think Christianity is. And uh, I agree with you. I, I mean, the reason I tell, tell the story about the synagogue is I was appall appalled that that was the vision they had, but they have that vision because it's what they see, it's what they hear, it's what they experience. And we have to help that be different. 
Well, I think, um, you know, again, using your voice is, the, is a, the most powerful thing that anyone, anyone can do. And, you know, if you have a fancy title, you might be able to get on TV or CNN. Uh, but any person who can write a couple of paragraphs and email them has a voice and can be read by millions of people. So letters to editors, I mean, I think, um, not to repeat the same thing again and again, um, are, are, the best, are the easiest. Uh, it takes 15 to 20 minutes and by far the most powerful way to have other people hear um, ideas that you want them to internalize because the purveyors of division are using the press. I mean, Donald Trump's um, strategy was mainly earned media. Uh, initially, they didn't invest a lot of money in advertising. He just was able to say certain things. Media played it on TV the next day, and people heard it. Uh, and it happened over and over again. And so, again, we are also able to purvey ideas of goodness to people and remind them to be their best selves. Um, and we all each have that power. We don't have to, be, have to have fancy titles or anything else. We all have the power of the pen. And uh, I think that's what right now is most needed, to remind people to be their best selves and remind them what's at stake. Um, the character of our nation, the character of our country is at stake. Um, and that will be determined by how we go through these tough times. I will tell you, some of you know that I get, uh, I ask for people that are going to be confirmed or received to send me a letter before I get there. And uh, so many of those are coming in right now because Cathedral Day, we're going to have at least 70 confirmations, maybe more. And uh, so I'm getting lots of letters right now, but I, and I try to read them all. And uh, I just want to say this, that two letters from two different congregations uh, mentioned in the course of them that they, were, they wanted to come to the Episcopal Church because they heard sermons surrounding some of the most recent events that were not the usual stuff. <laughs> it said, basically, no, that is not Christianity. Uh, you know, not in my mind. And so people were actually drawn to uh, this version uh, because of something they heard. So I think it's speaking out, it's saying no. <laughs> I'll go back to that, just say no. Uh, Nina. Nina. Bishop Greg, Arsalan, Salam Alaikum. Thank you both for your um, inspiring words tonight. I just wanted to ask a question, kind of two questions, pushing them together on deepening where do we go from here. So I think it's kind of safe to say that for most of us here, we either already have Muslim friends or family, coworkers, or we're willing and interested to talk with people should that opportunity arise, and we're here because we support this kind of endeavor. But what about the people who are not here? And we all know that we have friends and family and other people whom we know in our communities who aren't interested in these kinds of things, who wouldn't willingly walk into this space for this kind of topic. And well, that's so your, that's your job. So if you could speak a little bit to that. And <laughs> Arsalan already spoke a bit to my addendum, but if you have any further thoughts on what kind of resources on simply where do we deepen this dialogue? Where do we go from here? What kind of resources are available to, especially for those of us who aren't as educated even on Islam? It's like, okay, beyond the first conversation and beyond the first visit, where do we go from here? And as a little side note, if anyone wants to hear about Kids for Peace, I'm a board member. <laughs> but thank you both. Well, I think, uh, again, so uh, to educate the public, use the press. You all have a doorway in through letters to editors. Um, as far as, you know, neighbors, friends, uh, family members, uh, just talking to them about what you learn from a visit to a mosque or after tonight uh, is, is a way. Uh, but as far as deepening relationships, again, I think at least with Muslim communities, um, you know, again, mosques are open to people of all backgrounds, and prayers are just one thing that happen at most mo at mosques. Uh, many mosques, like Maps in Redmond, or many more, have other social events that happen there almost every Friday night, and many mosques every Friday and Saturday night. So you can just kind of drop in and hang out and meet people, and um, they often have hiking trips and things like that that you can sort of join uh, that are open to others. Um, people often bring their non-Muslim friends to those, uh, so they are open to everyone. So as far as deepening relationships, you can actually join those events that are happening. You can invite them over to church events um, as well. Uh, there's one more thing you asked for, I think, that Yeah, so I think just who are not here, I mean, if, if you know them, if you're, if you're, 
if they're friends, your friends, your colleagues, your, your family members, just have a chat with them and get to, uh, have them get to know someone that you're, you're friends with um, and just talk about what you heard tonight. Um, but beyond that, again, use the power of the press, the power of the pen, the cell phone that you have to send emails to editors and educate the millions out there through that. Yeah, I mean, I jumped in on you and said it, but uh, it's evangelism. It's uh, if you believe this, if you uh, feel this and you leave this room, then you have to go share it. Uh, I know that's very difficult for many Episcopalians, but I mean, we... That's the way it's going to change. I mean, Arslan can't do it all himself. I can't. We can't produce a video that's going to do it. You have to do it. So I would say, you know, if you need a specific task, uh, leave here with some commitment that the first time you hear somebody uh, say something that you know or feel is not correct, that you have the guts to say, I don't agree with you. Or... If there's a nicer way to do it, to do it. But to challenge it and to say, uh, no, I have a different opinion about that. I'd, I'd love to talk to you about it. If every person in this room did that, at least we would have conversation. You may not win them over, but that's not always the point. The point is for us to learn to be able to tackle these issues. And, uh, you know, if, if this uh, country needs anything right now, it's the model of how to do that in a civil way uh, without demonizing the other person and uh, having a, a, a true exchange of ideas. So I would encourage you to do that. That's, that's what for all the people that aren't here. <laughs> One more thing I'll quickly add is that there are also a lot of resources out there to learn more beyond tonight. Um, one is another website. Uh, one is ing.org um, slash FAQ, ing.org slash FAQ, um, has response, uh, responses to common questions people have about Islam and Muslims. And about the middle of April, there'll be another website called Islam Fact Check, islamfactcheck.org. And that has um, research-based responses or fact-based responses to common assertions um, that are often purveyed out there that are false, um, but you know, are repeated over and over again by politicians and others, and people believe they're true and they're not. Um, so that Islam Fact Check is more about sort of true versus false, and then hyperlinks to actual source data that, you know, provides the facts. So. I just want to thank all of you that are here, too. Yeah, thank absolutely. you very much. Yeah. And our, our uh, communications director said, uh, Arsalan, you've uh, fired off several websites. I think she's captured those. She'll post them on the St. Mark's website, CARE's website, C-A-I-R-W-A.org. Uh, C-A-I-R Seattle. .org, careseattle.org, and then uh, the diocesan website, if you want to watch those videos, ecww.org, Episcopal Church, Western Washington. Uh, We'll get all those posted on the website uh, for uh, stmarks.org. Again, uh, these conversations will continue on the serial Wednesday nights. There's flyers on the back and uh, uh, Love in a Time of Fear on Sunday afternoon, April 24th, about 1230. Uh, All of that's in the parish hall on the west end of this building. Uh, You're all most welcome. And continue the conversations and with the charges that Greg and Arsalan have given us uh, tonight for us to go forth from here. The cathedral shop is in the back with books, including the one that uh, Bishop Rickle uh, referenced. uh, And there are some uh, refreshments as we might continue the informal conversation with one another as we continue to build bridges. Let's hear it for Mr. Bakari and Bishop Rickle. Go in peace, salam, shalom. Thank you. Thanks.